Hello, this is Haku the Beacon, and I am reading to you. Oh, population controlled. Another side story of the SCP canon to the end of death, where death has become、um, abnormal and immortality has become the expected norm. And as such, nothing can die; everything lives. This is the story of one of the ways that they control the population of insect pop of insects, so that they don't overrun the planet. <sighs> It's hard to get the image of a sky that's ninety percent bugs out of your head, even if you've seen some pretty gruesome stuff in your line of work. Oh, right. <laughs> if you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, comment down below, and subscribe to the channel, as it will very much help me make more videos like this. Anyway, in the beginning, it's hard to get the image of a sky that's ninety percent bugs out of your head, even if you've seen some pretty gruesome stuff in your line of work. Our hands were already tight since everything up and went crazy, and people stopped dying. When entire ecosystems got thrown out of whack, we could barely do anything with that, with what the Foundation gave it to us on loan in Oregon. Marshes became bug paradises. A lot of people who lived near them called them heck. Entire houses were swarmed by termites, devouring it in a matter of days. Cicadas were so loud and so plentiful that you couldn't go outside in some in the summer without earplugs. And the mosquitoes, God, the mosquito swarms were as thick as mud. You had to practically wade through them in special suits if you wanted to go places without being without losing most, if not all, of your blood. When a swat doesn't kill them, they'll live. Live more than a few weeks. When it lived more than a few weeks. Bugs become less of an annoyance and more of a horror story. God knows what life is like in places like Louisiana and Florida right now. They had to be evacuated after the first six months. We did our best to make sure these animals didn't suffer, but it's hard. It's hard to figure out what's actually suffering and what's just us not being able to hear them crying about the pain. We knew when we signed the boring agreement that we would have to agree to some less unsavory stuff, but we never thought we would have to deal with this this torture apocalypse. A lot of the workload got to some of our people. Nandini couldn't take the stress of being head of the veterinary department. Poor woman, she just up and left when she saw a mountain lion with her stomach burst open, writhing with maggots, still mewling weakly in pain. She usually euthanized the poor girl in this case, but obviously that wasn't an option right now. Now, when the foundation called us to visit them in order to do something to do with this project, a lot of us didn't even want to show up. I myself almost considered breaking that agreement just so we didn't have to deal with so much of this weight. In the end, I went alone. Someone had to handle this, and it's more or less my job to protect people that need protecting. I was outfitted in a in a hazmat suit with a friendly little foundation logo on the on the breast. Hurried out of a van and into a fairly ominous-looking concrete building. When I asked, I was told that the site name was classified, and all I needed to know was that it specialized in chemical containment. If they thought a little pesticide was going to stop this, I would have walked out and in there. But I had to keep on. If there was a way to stop this, I had to at least try to hear it out. It took an uncomfortable amount of time in an elevator before we reached our, our destination. A stuffy little room secured by a few too many airlocks. Then I I thought were necessary. Yeah, I guess I had to be safe considering what could be stored here. Doctor Violet Mesmer, a woman who said she was on the ethics committee, greeted me as warmly as the founda as foundation members are known for. She seemed relatively calm and collected, at least, but that made me think she had no idea what was going on outside. I didn't know if I should have felt angry or jealous, but that didn't matter. I needed to be focused. 
eyes on the theoretical prize. Mr. Wilson, would it be wrong to assume that your operations are at least somewhat well known in the United States? Dr. Mesmer asked. I cleared my foot right before I replied. <clears throat> well, we've been trying to get ourselves out there. As I guess you know, we do videos on the animals that we're allowed to show, like when we raised a small family of affiliated woodpeckers after my mother and father got eaten by predators. I took a breath, stopping myself from getting too invested in the tangent. I wouldn't want to get cocky, but at least we are known pretty well in the Pacific Northwest. I said that wrong. Dr. Messer nodded and spoke. Hmm. Well, you're going to be a face now. We're busy enough dealing with the human population trying to keep everyone from taking advantage of their newfound immortality for less than safe reactions. Dr. Mesmer instructed her assistant, who had since been standing silently nearby, to get the cylinders as they flitted away. I felt a little sad that in our brief interaction that I'd never bothered to ask their name. I'm usually much more on top of getting to know people. But I guess, you know, life kind of stressed me out. <sighs> You're already intimately familiar with animals, I would assume, from what I've read about you and your organ or in your organization. Their preservation and safety seems to be a bit of a passion for you, no matter what kind of animal it is. Dr. Mesmer remarked as she turned back to face me. Well, <laughs> you're pretty on the nose there, partner. Not exactly hard to see, I'd say, but that's not the point you're getting at, is it? I replied. Astute, you'll essentially be tasked with so using something we've been developing and perfecting for the last few years on the animal population to stop their growth. At this point, the assistant came in, holding a box with three vials of something light blue inside them. And considering the fact that it is somewhat questionable, having recognized face take action rather than us, a shadowy organization should remove a few of the roadblocks. The kind of assistant set a down the vials in front of us, each supporting one neat little label. label. Dr. Master and Julie took took the leftmost vial, labeled SCP-3287-1 and held it, looking at it. She didn't bother to look at me as she continued to talk. It's a gaseous sterilizing agent. Simply exposing any living subject to it and within in 60 seconds, they will be instantly sterilized. Or at least... That's what's in this vial, Dr. Mesmer said, sitting down the, the first vial carefully. Bit of an obvious question, but what are in the other two vials then? I asked, answering towards the other vials. Well, Dr. Messer began, finally turning towards me. Technically, we don't know. Plenty of people have theories, but none of them are confirmed. We've tried dozens of tests, but we'll just have to go on a gut feeling here because we'll be needing you to either confirm or deny these substances. She sighed, which I assumed was her signifying she finished what she was saying. I said quiet when she finished, assuming she'd have something more to say, but that never happened. After a few seconds, I finally said something. Are you trying to... Are you asking me to try to figure out what the uh, theory, or are you waiting for me to agree it's using these things? Dr. Mesmer sighed. I'm sorry, I got distracted. The working theory is these files are, well, retroactively sterilizing their subjects. 
Yeah, if you use these gases on the right animals, you could easily stop problems before they even happen, or happened in some cases. Obviously, you'll need to be briefed with how to properly use this, but you will need to give verbal and written confirmation that you consent to using this. Should it go wrong? Go wrong, I ask. You could be erased from existence. Nobody would remember you, your organization, and would uh, never exist. Anything that you did for humans and animals li alike would never happen, Dr. Mesmer said flatly. I need a yes or no before we can continue. <sighs> you could always count on the Foundation to gamble everything but their own skin on something if it meant that they could uh, maybe learn a shred of information about it. This, they really just asked me if I wasn't just willing to die, real, willing to risk the lives of every poor critter I had saved in my years upon years of working. What they said was absolutely crazy. It was inhumane. It was... It was... It was the only shot we had. If I didn't do it, everyone would be damned to a world of locusts and mosquitoes and mayflies and horseflies and wasps and... Well, I don't exactly need to list them all out, but even they know it's theoretical. They apparently hadn't even tested the dang stuff. It's just, I need to decide. I need to be the one to say whether or not I was willing to wait for a definitive solution, or risk everything for that one that could help us now before it gets too bad. I gave my answer. Surprisingly, life was relatively easy once people started becoming immortal. Something about what happened made a lot of the animals sterile. So we didn't have to deal with issues of overpopulation and whatnot. Our main problem was make, uh, was just making sure animals didn't suffer too much if they got into the, the scrapes. Sure, we couldn't euthanize them, but we did make it, it our best to make sure they were at least taken care of as best as we could. I'm guessing he agreed to it. Anyway. Of course, a few people started going and started raving mad once they found out they could live forever, but the thought of mortality meant no repercussions. I love fine folks at foundation sets that they got that covered. If anyone ever decides to do something like break into a zoo and release all the lions or something like that, we handle it. Oddly enough, we've been dealing with more domestic stuff than anomalous stuff ever since this all happened. That's so bad at, at, at hard when an animal comes in, hit by a car with its legs crushed but still breathing. It takes a while to get used to it, but considering how much has been done to improve the quality of life for humans, I bet that was given to us to help these animals suffer as well as they could. Needless to say, the veterinary department's a bit overworked, but Nan just says she'll be fine as long as she has enough of her, no her novels to read it, it on her downtime. You know, you'd expect something everyone is calling the apocalypse or the rapture to be scary and dark and full of madness. Sometimes it's good to just be a guy who works with animals at a time like this. Being able to nurse them back to health, seeing them running and happy again. It's like these animals are making me, making us all feel a little more human. I thank whoever is up there every day for my organization. And sometimes I gotta think, think someone a little down to earth. You run for those doctors over by the foundation. Our organization probably would have faded into obscurity. Instead, they decided to let us do our thing. I think a lot of us appreciate that. I certainly do. So my guess is that the leader of this organization, or whoever they are, agreed to using in the sterilizing agent. But they also sterilize a lot of bugs into never existing in the first place, as well as sterilizing some bugs into not being able to breed at all. Anyway, this was a little side story of uh, the SCP -E End of Death canon. Please leave a like, comment, or and subscribe on the video. I'll see you next time, probably for something different.